So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. It's my great pleasure to welcome here uh, as part of the Photograph Festival uh, Kaisa Dahlberg, who is presenting her work together with Terka Skal at Hunt Kastner, and uh, Kalil Shoresh, uh, whose show we will have a chance to see tonight uh, for the first time. Uh, we are going to start with uh, short presentations of uh, both artists and then we'll ask also uh, Jirka Skala and Laura Aman, uh, who were working on uh, the show at Hunt Kastner to participate in the uh, discussion. So, uh, thank you Jan, thank you everybody trying this display but also the festival, uh, photography festival. I'm very um, happy to uh, come more than a day to Prague and be able to show you part of a project that um, interests us for a very strange reason. Because Joanna and me, we've been working together as filmmaker and artist. And since 1999, uh, we've been collecting spams. Just to understand how it leads us to think about uh, spam and scam in the internet, it's, um, we are filmmaker and artist. Uh, and uh, we've been working on the status and the issue of images and narration because we are from Beirut and there we had a lot of problems to deal with the images, especially in a post-war uh, periods, post-wars periods. So after one of the wars, uh, it was the wars of 2006 between Israel and Lebanon, we were wondering what kind of fiction we can believe what kind of images we can believe after a war. So we take this literally and experimented with an actress, a French uh, actress called Catherine Deneuve and with our um, dear friend Javier Mroué with whom we made five films. In this film, one of the attempts was how can I believe that Catherine Deneuve can play a role in Lebanon? What kind of fiction can she embody after a war? So little by little we were um, dealing with this issue about uh, fiction representations and then we, the project we did after was related on a true event that everybody forget in Lebanon, meaning that in the Lebanon in the 60s we had a space project, uh, a group of uh, students, um, dreamers, produced designed, produced, and launched more than 10 rockets for space exploration. So you have number four that is here. It looks like a joke. And actually in Lebanon it appeared as a joke. Meaning that nobody was believing that really this happened in Lebanon in the 60s. Like, um, so you see, in the first one it was how can we do a fiction after a document uh, after a war and this one is how a real story was becoming a fiction and we uh, so this lead us to start to think about the scam which are a fiction because it's a scam but people believe in it because it's very efficient and every year you have more than 2 billion dollars that are transferred just from Nigeria uh, from the US especially to West Africa so you all receive this kind of spam and, uh, and scam. We've been collecting them and putting them in a folder. We don't know why we call this folder in French Aides pour devenir rich, which is the translation help to become rich. Probably we were tempted to enter this at the beginning of our collection in the, in the 19th, in the end of the 90s. So mm, we were choosing only scam and spam that were giving us like a small narrative, a story where you have a person trying to say I'm the son of Gaddafi, Mubarak or any other Arab leaders or African leaders. Um, by thinking about this uh, na narration, we discovered that this comes from a very old tradition and actually at the entrance you have what we call the Jerusalem letter. It is an extract <coughs> taken from this book. This, this book is a book made by the chief of the police in France. And they call it the, um, the Jerusalem letter. It had nothing to do with Palestine at that time. Or, uh, uh, it was just because the prison was in Jerusalem streets. 
So basically, it happened that after the French Revolution, um, this kind of letter appeared, meaning due to the French Revolution, due to the event, we had to escape on our way to Switzerland at that time. We hide a treasure. My master asked me to go back to bring it. If, so what you are proposing here is um, a pixelate text, where usually you can see it from far, but when you become closer, it becomes much more difficult to see. To understand, because maybe some of you went inside the show, these cams are located in places where this narration can be plausible. Meaning, if I tell you that I have a million dollars in cash in Paris, you will have some doubts. If I tell you that I have it in Lebanon, you will have less doubts. If I tell you that I have it in Iraq, you will have no doubts. Meaning there is certain story that are possible in certain location, in certain places. So the context is important. Catherine Deneuve can play a fiction in France. It's much more difficult to play it in Lebanon, and especially after an event like the 2006 war. So meaning these are the context where a story can be embodied, where a story can be plausible or not. And this is what leads us to start to imagine that if we study carefully these camps, we have a kind of mapping of an imaginary of corruption, because all this is about greed and corruption. Okay? The corruption, so we took all the data, start to make a modelization of this data, and try to make and to see how each year this imaginary was moving and focusing on certain parts and on others. For example, mo uh, Russia at the moment was very important as a place of corruption and after it disappeared and now today it's back. Madoff, you all hear it about Madoff. Madoff generates a huge amount of spam and scams. So you will see, uh, we have 2005, 2008, 2010. So what was interesting also for us is to, because these scams are fictions, meaning they are even immaterials. Let's give them a body. Let's try to embody them. And you will see a first work. Painful. Painful. The second has surprising, as in my love, was here such an email every day. I'd like first to introduce myself. My name is Mrs. Vivian Salim, a wife of a lovely husband, named Nassim Salim, and the mother of three children. The oldest one is Hassan. I had was a big dream, only called in the eyes of Hassan. The other dream was Wasim. He was 12 years old. And my youngest dream was six years old, named Myrna. I had a warm family. I loved them a lot. Everything passed away a year ago in the moment. When the Americans hit everything, just destroyed my entire family in the moment. I suddenly I my three children, freezing bodies. I tried a lot to move them, but they passed away. Everything was destroyed in the moment. Just for oil. Everything faded. My entire family faded. What I'm trying to do now is survive. I now live with my parents. I work in a hospital. I'm trying to survive by remembering my lovely family, my warm family. Is my lovely husband letting me $29.5 million by a financial security company? I'm writing this mail to you with a great sorrow in my heart. It will come as a surprise to you because you don't know me. But you know all the nature of my situation. Please, bear with me. I'm 22 years old. My name is Esther George Jacobin. I'm the only child and a daughter 
of the Honorable George Jacobi, the Minister of Tourism and Commerce. He worked. Dear yes, sir, it's quite unusual to have this kind of business proposal. Mostly to someone you've not come across before. I will introduce myself. My name is Colonel George Ibe of the Ghanaian Armed Forces, currently serving in the four. Dear friend, my dear friend, my name is Akar Sosnitsky. I was a personal assistant to Mr. Mikhail Kudarkovsky, who was an owner of the largest oil company in Russia, Yukos. Okay, how about yeah. What we were trying is to ask um, non-professional actors to embody these uh, images. We were trying to, in a way, built after the mapping of this cartography to make a kind of history, an alternative history from this junk image, taking what is, because this junk are in a way the symptom of our history. So by doing those, we made two installations. The first one that you would see here called A Letter Can Always Reach Its Destination, which is the title of a, of a, um, a seminar of Lacan, and Gijak uh, responds to him. But there is another way to present it, which is a rumor of the world, which is this large installation uh, showing 28 screens with, that are um, all running in the same time. And in the middle, you have this, all the, the voices. And after you are attracted by one face, and you will go and hear the voice of this person in a shot counter shot. And in the middle, you have um, all, you have a hundred speakers in this room, and all the speakers are uh, conveying in this middle point that is a rumor of the word. Oh, you will notice. Sorry, I'm going to go back to uh, You will have this video because it happened that during our uh, uh, the, the shooting, one of the actors, Fidel, that you just saw very briefly, knows the text more than, more than us, meaning that uh, we made some cuts in the text and he was manning. And by a pure coincidence, it appears that he was the one that wrote it. He, wa he was a scammer in Nigeria. He quit Nigeria. We were shooting in Lebanon. And I don't know how it happened that this guy was saying the text that he wrote when he was a scammer in Nigeria. Now he's a personal coach in Lebanon and he does striptease for bachelor parties. But nevertheless, before, he was a scammer. So he gave us the structure because we were like fascinated. First, we, we were not believing that we were facing the guy that we were. What is the chance that such a thing happened? Nevertheless, when it happened, you have to follow it. So he tell us about the story. And what was amazing is that he was building this story like in a film. I invite you to, to hear a little bit of it. For you to have a good film you know, produced, the characters have to be very good also. Because no, no producer or director would want to give out a film that is not you know, what why? So that people, when they are watching it, they will feel, oh, this is real. Don't tell me this is a movie. So every, 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 every movie will have to keep the victim in suspense. So, so it's really another kind of movie. It's another kind of movie that you cannot really explain it. It's a never-ending story. The story about it does not end. Because there are a whole lot of people who are very much good in what they do. So, and this, 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 scam, this scam job, you have to be smart. For you to convince someone you've not seen. For you to convince someone you don't know. For you to convince someone that you might not even see, but we pay whole lots of money to you, you have to be smart. So it's, we can spend 
Okay, you will see, uh, because the video is presented here in the exhibition. At first, we thought that the, this relation to, to faith was because we were naive, in a way, meaning that we had no... We were... Um, it, it was a lack of information. But uh, soon after, we discovered the, uh, a website, especially in the US, uh, about people who are trying to scam the scammers. It's called scam beaters or scam eaters. Okay, just to understand, the US government asks Nigeria to make a law against scammers. So it is called, four, the law is number 419. This is why we call them 419 scammers. It's a number of the law in, uh, in uh, Nigeria. So scammers were not anymore scamming from their apartment. They were going to internet cafe. So they are the kind of public thing. Eh? So they won't be catch. So, so they have to pay to spend time in internet cafe. So little by little, first the scam beaters start to spoil their time. Meaning if they answer and ask for specific questions, so the scammer will not be able to answer by a copy-paste, but will spend time producing a new text, a specific answer. That means that he's losing money. Time equal money here. That's it. <laughs> uh, and uh, little by little, they were entering in this new production of literature, you can even say, and they start to ask for what they call trophy. We don't know why most of these trophies that are present on this website are related to the art world. So they are sculpture, painting, performance. You will see a small selection here, and it is a place called the, the, the trophy room. So you see you have performances, film, sculpture, painting, several things. I invite you to read them on the scroll because it is sometimes funny. And you always wonder how a, a person that is used to scam will accept this kind of story. In what can you believe? What are the story in which you can believe? For example, this is the, the face of a scam beater. He asks the scammer, to make a reproduction in wood as a sculpture and to ship it because he's a gallerist and he uh, wants to make a, com uh, a competition of sculpture and he assure him that he will get the, the first prize and he, after he will be able to make the whole transfer. So he sent, the scam beater sent it, but the scammer, uh, the scam beater will say, yeah, but you receive it and it's destroyed. Look what's happened with it. It's just a Photoshop, but the scammer managed to believe in it. So this is the central question. How can we believe in certain stories? How we can accept the encounter with realities that are not plausible? It happens. The last project is related to six of our actors. It happened that these actors are people that are living in <coughs> Lebanon, but they are not Lebanese. They live in a kind of extraterritoriality. There is a Syrian and a, a Nigerian, but also people who are mixed of different persons. There is an Iraqi doctor that ended in Lebanon, where she became a Christotherapeut, meaning that she's trying to save drug addiction by praying the Christ. So this is, there's a movement from a secular place to another kind of place. There is this two... However, these two persons are people who are born in Lebanon, but their parents are the two younger, Omar and, uh, and Yusuf. Their parents are Africa, uh, one from Ghana, the other from uh, Benin, 
with, uh, and their mother are from Sierra Leone and Philippines. Their parents were married in their original country, and those kids had not been recognized neither by the father, neither by the mother, neither by the Lebanese states. So they live in a very bizarre status. Not, uh, they, ha they have no papers, they cannot travel, and they have to deal with all this question about belonging, transmission, culture. They speak Arabic better than me, but they are not uh, uh, from Lebanon. They will never be Lebanon. And it's all about this relation to a certain territory. You belong to a territory, but this territory is a fiction. So this is how, little by little, this question about uh, um, immateriality in the internet, because WWW, this is a kind of immaterial things ended by very local and symptomatic of certain places. So, um, there is a lot of to say, but I think it's better to, to end it. Just a question. We ended by um, having a conversation with a French philosopher called Jacques Rancière about this um, relation to trust and faith to, uh, in this, uh, in the age of internet, and he was talking about low intensity belief, meaning that today it may be better to still believe even if you are scam instead of becoming cynical and close to all what can happen in the real. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kaleo. And now I will ask Kaisa for. A short introduction, and uh, we will actually screen yeah. a new film, right? Well, yeah. Um, Let's not call it a film. Should we call it a film or not? It's a sort of. I wanted to take this opportunity to. Well, first, I wanted to say thanks to everyone for coming and for inviting me, Jen, Laura, and everyone. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of show this uh, um, uh, experiment. Uh, Thing. And uh, because when I was invited by Jen and Laura, we were talking about um, collaboration a lot and the possibility of, and also together with Jiri, about um, uh, the possibility of making a new work for the show. And at the time, I had just uh, kind of started a, a, a one of these artistic research uh, positions. Uh, so I'm hired by this institution in Stockholm called the Royalist. Institute of Art, uh, it's basically the Art Academy and stuff, uh, uh, to do uh, the so-called uh, artistic research. And so I was just uh, proposing that uh, I had this, uh, I will also just talk briefly about that, but uh, I, I said um, to Jen then that I have um, started uh, up kind of collecting these browsing sessions uh, or filming uh, people uh, filming a browsing sessions uh, on 16 millimeter film and I said that uh, uh, perhaps we could do one of these filmings here and so that's basically what we did. But I thought I'll just, uh, so I'm not going to really make a presentation but I wanted to just kind of uh, give some, uh, uh, some context for the work because also I don't know if you've been to Hunt Kressner Gallery, and, and I'm also really happy to discuss the work there uh, afterwards if you want to do that, or uh, if you have been able to see them. Uh, but the two uh, projects that are at the, the gallery are probably the only two works that I've ever made uh, that are not quite directly informed by a kind of um, queer feminist experience or uh, thought or theory. Um, so uh, this is really, um, uh, I, so therefore I also thought uh, I should say just a few words about the research that I'm doing now uh, and to then come back to the, to the showing of this film. Uh, so um, the project that I'm working on um, is a kind of investigation into, uh, um, uh, to looking at time-based, uh, the politics of time as something that is kind of inherent into the media of uh, moving images or the time-based media, 
but also into the kind of organization of everyday life. So I've also looked at this uh, um, kind of uh, queer, th there's a whole field called kind of queer temporality studies. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a kind of queer and feminist critique of what, uh, for instance, the theorist uh, Elizabeth Freeman calls the chrononormative. So the chrononormative is defined as um, the use of time to organize bodies towards maximum productivity. Um, so uh, the queer feminist critique then is to use, uh, uh, in a way, um, one's own experience uh, and uh, to kind of acknowledge the, the fact that uh, to show how history is in fact uh, not linear but full of kind of discontinuities and gaps and absences. So in a, in, in, in a broad sense it's a kind of critique of chrononormative frameworks such as um, how we talk about historical progress, uh, terms uh, such as development, uh, uh, economic growth in academia, it's lots of it, like discoveries and methodologies and all of these things. And Elizabeth Freeman also goes to quite kind of hands-on everyday things and talk about uh, schedules, calendars, time zones, wrist watches, as, um, uh, as all these devices that appear to give a kind of natural sense of time while uh, regulating uh, populations and individuals. So the first kind of um, zoom in that I've done in uh, this work is, is actually coming out of the work that is in the gallery, which is uh, engaged with um, uh, questions of labor and, uh, and, uh, and specifically maybe motion studies. So, um, uh, so um, <laughs> it has to do in a way with film history because when film was, uh, uh, for instance, I've, I've, one of my references is, uh, is this uh, Italian uh, film historian called Verillo Tossi. And his kind of thesis, he wrote this book called Cinema Before Cinema, which is kind of a, like a genealogy of how film came about. Um, but his kind of thesis is that uh, film was not invented by the Lumiere brothers in 1895 in Paris. But in fact, it was uh, invented earlier and in laboratories as kind of scientists of uh, this time was trying to understand kind of uh, human and animal motion. And um, so this is the kind of, so immediately when film was kind of invented, it was also used as a way to optimize labor, uh, as a way to maybe make armies move more efficiently and uh, all of these things. Um, but so while I was kind of doing this work, these other films started to show up, which were these films of uh, kind of ne ne early neurological films. So they were made in a way simultaneously, in a way like parallel, uh, which was in a way films of uncontrolled movements. And it's maybe not true to say uncontrolled movements, but movements that would not kind of fit within the sheen of the, of the productive body. So his, the hysterical woman is maybe uh, the kind of famous example in a way. Um, and so, and it was interesting to me also because these two films, the, 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 the one that w would try to depict the perfect movement of, or this kind of violence inflicted um, on the bodies in, in order to optimize like labor uh, in, uh, under capitalism, uh, that these films of motion studies, restricted motion studies and the kind of uh, uncontrolled movements were some, sometimes difficult to, to tell the difference between them. And, and they were also mostly all of them um, uh, carried out by anonymous workers, very often on women, on people of color, uh, on animals, uh, uh, poor people or chronically ill. Uh, so this, these were two kind of parallel stories and I, I was very interested, or, or this first project that I'm kind of working on now is to, to kind of how could we look at these films as a kind of act of resistance to 
to uh, structures for optimized labor. Um, so, um, but then to come back to this uh, uh, film, I'm just thinking it was something else I wanted to say. Uh, yeah. No. But so then I uh, I had this idea that, that um, so I've had this like kind of parallel projects <laughs> that I've been working on and one of them were this idea to film these uh, browsing sessions. <coughs> so this is the film that we're gonna uh, see now and I haven't seen it myself. Um, I had my child was <laughs> starting kindergarten and uh, I wasn't able to come for the. Uh, for the making of it, and I should also say that it's very much a collaboration. Um, first of all, Trini, who is the provider of the content of the film, who is the one, the person browsing, and uh, Jen and Laura and uh, Tomas, who filmed it, and then I've also invited this amazing uh, <laughs> musician, um, Adina, who will also make uh, la uh, music um, as we go along to this 10 minute uh, film. So, but, um, but in a way, I mean, of course, it was a kind of interest in, uh, I mean, the kind of instruction that I gave, first of all, was that there would be someone born in uh, 1993 or later. Uh, because I was thinking it should be a person who kind of, even though they might not be like uh, obsessed with internet or whatever, or even have an much access, that it would be someone who was kind of born into the world when these technologies were already uh, part of our bodies in a way. And, uh, and, and the other thing is that it's mostly just a kind of, almost like a stream of consciousness or this kind of flaneur kind of just... Uh, doing what you would do every day so the idea that it would be kind of associative and that it would be a film that didn't have a plot or didn't have a kind of purpose in a way and and then um, and then of course it's a kind of like uh, there is of course the kind of acron uh, acronism of the 60 millimeter film uh, which is in a way, I mean, a bit silly, of course, but uh, the 60 meter millimeter film filming the computer, but it's all, it was also for me, like I was also thinking about um, the kind of, the two, that they, they also inhabit different index indexicalities, so they have different relations to truth. And I thought it would be kind of interesting to play with this somehow. So, like, uh, you've seen it, but I think that's it. <laughs> so, well, um, should we just do it Let's and see what happens? <laughs> right. Is yeah. there someone in the back who can turn it on, or should we? Maybe we should. Can we, can we turn off the...
So, I mean, before we start with the, with the discussion, maybe just a short comment from my side about the production of the film, because uh, Kaisa somehow mentioned it already, but uh, the important thing is that uh, all of this was done over a certain distance without any means of control. And uh, we somehow selected a team of people who 
from from FAMO who will produce this film. Uh, Kaisa just gave them this one page of instructions. And uh, the same actually happened also with Adina, like the process somehow developed organically uh, without uh, some kind of uh, post-production or controlling mechanisms, uh, which I find quite interesting also on in the way how how Jimmy is uh, moving through the web and the repetition is somehow continuous. Anyway. And I think I also forgot to, actually to say that the, uh, that the idea was to kind of create an archive of this and to do this with the students at the institution where I'm at over the now five years I'm going to be there. So, so this was a sort of just the beginning. I've done one before. <laughs> Uh, with, uh, then it was a group, uh, a small group of students, and it, it was a lot censored, uh, uh, centered around uh, the war in Syria because one of the students uh, is from Syria and he also make these works about these servers where people put up, uh, are able to, uh, anyone basically is able to put up imagery and uh, videos, uh, their own images and videos from the war. So yeah, so I mean there is this kind of randomness, uh, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But that was also your starting point for this, that it would be this ending of the archive and the beginning of the, exactly. the log, logs, or yeah. maybe better word than archive. I don't know, maybe just uh, <coughs> invite Irka and Laura if they want to join us, uh, so we can uh, continue the discussion. But I will still, uh, despite sorry, despite your presence, I will still at first uh, react to what we heard in the first part of uh, of this uh, of this panel. Uh, I would like to pose a certain cross question, maybe, because Khalil was talking a lot about, uh, let's say, politics of location or about certain geographical distances and uh, their meanings uh, in creation of certain narration in their work with Joanna. Uh, you were working, you were talking mainly about politics of time. I would wonder if you would turn it around, uh, how would you uh, somehow relate to uh, geographical politics and how would you relate to time politics? Who would like to start? Nice, oh no, I have to think about that. <laughs> okay. um, we use a lot the, um, the concept, the relation to time in different ways. Uh, uh, it's to um, it's to avoid this concept of territory as a geography, exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, but to consider it that it's uh, um, a shared issue. Uh, with a person in a certain time. So it's not working on a diachrony, but on a synchrony, on a moment, specific moment. And this is what leads us to this concept of being contemporary. It's sharing the same issue, the same time, at the moment with other person. One of the works related to the SPAM project is called Desynchronicity, where you have four screens uh, with all the people related to the Internet Cafe are synchronized in the four different locations. So you, they pass from one place to another. But this cannot be done only uh, really stage. Uh, I'm talking about this because this is also related to other body of work where we are working with poetry, with uh, the film with Etel Adnan, where Etel Adnan is uh, a woman that is 93 years, but is, she is still very contemporary to us, and we are contemporary with her. So it's about this contemporary, for me, is more territory, is more a question of time than a question of geography. Nevertheless, geography are important because these are the places where you have this idiosyncrasy meaning that they are producing specificity in these places where you have a story that can be possible in a place and not possible in another place. You are talking about uh, history, about this notion of uh, 
continuity in history where in Lebanon, for example, having just a, a police film where um, it's impossible, it will be a science fiction. You kill somebody, you don't go to prison, you can become prime minister, you see, which is here maybe something a little bit more difficult, or at least in Norway or in, in Sweden. Usually when you kill somebody, you have to go to prison. No, Lebanon, you can go and become a minister. So you see, this is a kind of joke, but nevertheless, the specificity of the place, of the location, bring different relation to, to the writing of history. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a, in a way, I think, uh, very much related to what you've already said, but, but also, because I've also kind of, through um, the research that I've done, come across, for instance, like the field of, which is really interesting, the contemporaneity studies, which is kind of the study of um, of our contemporary moment, and and also it's maybe precisely this the kind of uh, dissolving of time and space on the one hand, like how um, technologies allow us to kind of be in different places at the same time and, uh, and times at the same time in a way, and, and something very local can exist at the same time as the kind of modernist grand narratives. And there, there is not a kind of contradiction in this anymore. It's a more kind of complex relation between time and uh, space, perhaps. But also, like the other side of it, maybe the kind of um, uh, uh, acknowledging the diff different modes of kind of lived temporalities that in this year. Uh, Era, it's of course very apparent that uh, the earth, for instance, has another temporality that we force upon it. So this kind of um, sens sensitivity to to other temporalities. I don't, sorry, I don't know if I responded. But, uh, yeah, very good. Thank you. Now uh, I uh, would maybe turn it now a bit uh, into the context of the Photograph Festival and continuing with this line of questioning about uh, time politics or about time in this respect. Uh, because uh, creating or putting together a certain selection of artists for this, uh, for this festival, uh, I thought about it also in terms of a certain timeline because uh, we have three very strong positions uh, which are evolving similar uh, topics or similar narratives, uh, but in different moments of a, of a history. And uh, your and Joanna's project uh, is actually for me kind of a starting point because you are talking about uh, <coughs> spam emails, which are really uh, very strongly connected with the beginnings of, uh, of the internet. And uh, your research started already uh, at the end of the <coughs> which is a time when, uh, when the spam traffic was already enormously uh, huge and influential. And uh, I wonder nowadays at the moment when uh, we can talk about uh, internet as a form to, or as a medium to influence uh, huge state elections and uh, very, in a very simple way manipulate human mind uh, how do you actually perceive these spam emails uh, nowadays because they are so complex and they are almost like a very specific kind of literature in a certain way. But uh, nowadays it seems that uh, you just need to put a good advertisement on someone's uh, social network's wall and uh, the situation is solved without uh, any complex storytelling. So I would just uh, ask how you perceive this thing with this time distance? Um, I think it's a little bit more complex. Like, even if you have the best people behind you to do the best branding, marketing, it won't work. There's always a kind of miracle or at least a, a thing that disturbs this equation. Good people, right place, produce the right stuff and have a good effect. This is actually what's happened with the industry of cinema. You have the best script, the best actor, the best script, and the film is a shitty film. Why? We don't know. 
And this is what makes things still alive. Like it's something much more organic. It's not just we are planning, we build them in the right narration. So are you, are you trying to say that uh, all this uh, discussion uh, about this like internet post-truth uh, reality is actually just a mere coincidence or like randomness? Somehow? I think that just it's a tool that are changing, meaning that this, uh, our scan are already present in letters in the 16th century or in the 18th century. What interests me is what are the conditions for such letters or spam or things to reappear. Mm -hmm. Meaning that you have to have a trouble in your society that allows this kind of things to reappear. Mm -hmm. Meaning it's not just the tool, it's not internet. It's the re same relation with photography because we were talking about 16 millimeters and things like this. The relation to pictures. Well, I have a daughter that managed in six months of Snapchat to make more images than all my archive in 25 years. <coughs> Yeah, but it's another kind of thing, it's another tool, it's another thing. Nevertheless, it, it tells me about her relation to society and to the, to the real, not, never reality, to the real meaning that, to what's happening. So this is what interests me, for me, it's, it's never planned. Mm. We cannot plan it yet. Well, that sounds good, I like that. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, I would maybe now try to switch a bit to the, or like go to the subject of the, of the show of Ed Hunt Kastner, so we can then uh, put it together. Uh, because uh, work we can see here at Transit Display uh, is pretty much evolving around this fictional uh, narration. But uh, Kaisa's work presented that uh, Hunt Kastner is somehow very similar in terms of uh, perception of certain artificially created uh, belief because belief that uh, you can optimize labor and you can somehow shift the uh, human body to uh, this machinic position, somehow automate it and expect uh, better productivity, whatever that means. Uh, this aspect is also somehow very strongly present in, uh, in the whole exhibition and in its uh, curatorial setup. Maybe uh, Laura can start and explain a bit uh, how the thing, how the spatial setup that Hunt Kastner came about. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the idea for the uh, spatial setup at the exhibition was to somehow try to translate uh, what, uh, in my opinion, was the common denominator <coughs> of the words of uh, Irka and Kaisa, which was in this uh, sense. Uh, optimization uh, or structuring also of uh, labor and uh, of our time in general and uh, so I, I try to apply this idea also or to find a simple way to somehow optimize this process of distributing the artworks in the gallery. So we basically uh, took all the surfaces in the gallery that are available and big enough to hold an artwork and uh, unfolded it to one ideal surface uh, which is uh, practice uh, that is very common in architectural production to use, to, to uh, optimize the use of material basically. And then evenly distributed all the artworks and then you fold it back into three-dimensional space. And the outcome is of course not an optimized uh, exhibition at all because you have uh, artworks that are hung in a very different way than you would usually do at, uh, different, at heights that are too low or too high. But it also refers in a, in a way a bit to the content uh, um, of this method uh, time um, measurement because there it's all about movements uh, that are recorded, measured and uh, optimized. And so it's also with this idea that in the exhibition you have to perform these uh, movements of uh, reaching, grasping, uh, and uh, etc. Mm -hmm. So this was basically the translation to the curatorial concept. Yeah, Hirka, can you somehow react to that, how uh, your work, which is, uh, I wouldn't say focusing mainly on uh, leisure time, because uh, the very precise uh, uh, definitions are more connected with questions of labor again, and questions of distribution of time. Uh, but uh, the way how we were composing those images, uh, it always creates this certain uh, 
kind of cozy landscape almost, or this like cozy still life into which you are putting your uh, main working tool, your laptop. Yeah. So um, how does that actually correspond with uh, with this uh, with this exhibition setup and with this optimization process in Kaisa's films? Uh, it's uh, there is uh, I think it's, it's like it's done. I don't know. Uh, Laura like put it like quite nicely together. Like because I think that uh, I try to optimize optimize myself, my like my time, like because uh, uh, I grew up in a working family and I, I studied craft like in the beginning of the 90s and I I spent my like, first 20 years like in a like what uh, guys standing called uh, calls like block of times like really like like the, there are or, like eight hours of work eight hours of leisure and eight hours of rest sleep and this for me is like first like 20 years of my life was about this about like really like about the heritage of modernism and uh, when i moved to prague and uh, after like uh, eight years became artist, like everything changed. Like the the whole setup which in which I grew up like fall apart. And uh, and for me it's all the time the question uh, in which kind of uh, time I live, like how I perceive time. And and this uh, this work is about this to find the right uh, solution for myself to to like to came with the rational answer to myself how much time I spent with like to produce art, how much time I spent with my family and uh, how much time I, uh, I uh, spent with, with students in academy and how much time I, I uh, do the stuff which I, I don't like mostly like to uh, to clean things, to help to others, like you see, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and say, yeah, I will do it. It's no problem for me, and so on. <laughs> and uh, uh, and also because, like, I know a lot of like theories about speak, uh, which generally speak about the time change, space change, but. Uh, uh, the, there is nothing specific like to my my life that I decided that I will uh, like came with some solutions. That, that's uh, that's why I I uh, I came with the idea that I will uh, like uh, I will use my hard drive as the the the, the tool which uh, and the every every like the digital files and and. Uh, which I have there, like the the research tool for me that and I that I will measure how much the the work it's related to art, how much work it's related to to fem, the, how much files are related to fem and so on. And this this the, mm -hmm. this is about the the, the, the whole work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, mm -hmm. ask guys again. Uh, how you actually, because not only that you saw the film uh, today for the first time, but uh, you also saw the show for the first time today, mm -hmm. uh, same as Khalil, because uh, due to this, again, precarious state, we were not able to provide for you like mm -hmm. enough means to come on many times and to install the show and prepare it. So uh, can you somehow react to these two positions of Laura and Mirka? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Well, I was thinking um, you were <laughs> speaking now because it's the uh, one film, the one called Rich Grasp, uh, um, uh, the kind of uh, initial idea for that was uh, that I had, uh, it came through another work, but, uh, but were these stories that there seemed to be this kind of fight over time, like in, in very hands-on, in labor, like in different workplaces. So, the kind of employee tries to figure out the ways to steal as much time as possible from the workers and then the workers kind of figure out ways to fight back in, in different ways. So this was the kind of oscillation that I was interested in. But then um, it was because one guy that I'm interviewing uh, who works at the Amazon in Leipzig, and you, you probably all know that the Amazon is like a terrible employee most, and uh, you basically don't have any possibility of moving or deciding what you do. Um, but his response to that was, was to do the same thing. 
actually, to, to measure the time it would take him to walk from his workplace to the metal detector to the lunchroom and then use that as kind of uh, argument against his employees. And then I was thinking about you and you, you're like um, kind of also letting the hard drive uh, um, <coughs> uh, control your life a little bit. And like, what would be the opposite response? For the, like, how could you kind of like, I don't know, like, sorry, I'm just being very speculative now, but I was thinking like, what would be the, the sort of, uh, the kind of resistance to that or the, the kind of uh, surrealistic response to, to, to trying to keep track of the time sequence. Mm -hmm. I was just... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that there, there is no answer because like, for example, <laughs> autonomists tried in Italy in the early 60s and they failed, okay. like after like 15, because uh, this is this realistic stuff like from history of Europe. And, uh, mm -hmm. and also, uh, like uh, uh, during my studies in academy, I worked uh, for one company in, in uh, storage, like big storage, and uh, there was all the time this fight between the management and the, the guys in store because the management usually came with the big like graphs and say, you don't work uh, like su sufficient enough, and we spend like 12 hours each day there. <laughs> and say no, no. They in Hungary they work like like more, and like and uh, there are less people for the same like so. And this was like, and this when I studied the history of uh, like uh, workers' movement, they usually had, the main problem was this that when they try to have some conversation with the management, they usually use this tool that they have like big graph and they say no, we have this measure, we measure it and this you don't, like you are not right and so on. That I think that the only one the possibility to be more rational, to use the, the tool of a management, but don't forget why you use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe Khalil, do you have uh, something to add to the show itself? Uh, to the show, then. It, uh, um, it was not the first time because I came for a sensation a few days ago. No, but the show. Uh, and oh, I, I, I found um, it was quite disturbing because this idea of the algorithm mm -hmm. and this idea of a management, meaning for me, it's um, always I try to understand the, uh, the context or um, the program, the code that is asking behind. Meaning, for example, when um, one of the questions, uh, if you answer how we can do about the hard disk, actually in thin, in the thin industry, we are now very worried about um, film are not anymore on 35 millimeters. Okay, they are, uh, we are using most of the time DCP, okay, which is hard disk. And the hard disk, are limited after two years. You cannot use them anymore. They, ha they have, they are obsolete. Mm -hmm. So now, for the filmmaker, for the archive, they are thinking about going back to the 35 millimeters. Mm -hmm. To just for the archive, it would be just to have a trace. That the trace, to, because on the 16 millimeters, you will always have the frame. You don't need to transcode it to something else. It's like not a VHS. Who knows what is a umatic or beta cam, beta max? All these different kind of mediums that disappeared, and it's the obsolescence. Mm -hmm. So there is something a resistance of certain material materiality against the transcode. What is I do the algorithm? And behind this, there is also um, a context. For example, when you were talking about the film of the primitive time, what they call primitive time, it's a the beginning of the cinema. Something changed completely with the, intro, uh, with the film uh, Birth of a Nation by Griffiths. Mm -hmm. This is what changed completely the history of cinema because suddenly he was taking the narration from Dickens and this notion of continuity. But because he was building a nation, mm -hmm. there's a nation 
behind the project, the nation project that was behind it. It's to try to make a link to be efficient. This is the term he was saying. And little by little to introduce a kind of vocabulary that can be shared by everybody. Again, this, you had the uh, cinema of the dialectic cinema that was completely in an opposition. Mm. One win more than the other. But, um, but there is always alternative history. Meaning that for me, we have to know what was the project behind it. The project was to build a nation. Uh, so here, what I, uh, I was really interested, actually, we had this conversation before, so I won't really ask the same question, but <coughs> to reverse it, uh, the notion of efficiency. By itself, for me, it's a question. What is efficient? It can be efficient in a place and, uh, and produce other things in another place that are more relevant or have a delay in their, um, in a delay in their action or in their effect. Yeah. Do you have something? Well, I'm not sure if it's an answer, but, um, but I'm quite happy in a way that you, that you, so, like, that you were, that were kind of disturbed. <laughs> Because I was very surprised, I was quite curious uh, to hear the reactions when we had the opening and afterwards discussing it. And I was very surprised that it, there seemed to be two categories of responses to the display. And it was either uh, case number one that uh, people uh, didn't know why it looked like this, but they also didn't question it, they just accepted it. And they were not wondering why, this, why it looks like this and why this lights. And, uh, and the second one was, was uh, where the people that knew about the concept and that it was translation of the content of the artworks to the curatorial concept and they also just accepted it. So there was very little discussion actually about uh, what it means and uh, uh, what it produces. But uh, I think maybe what I, the attempt was in a way to create, to, to translate it into this uh, idea of optimization, which at the end is not an optimal result at all, like creating this kind of uh, contradictory sentiment that I feel that is also somehow part uh, of the of this of the topics. And it's what I find very interesting is that uh, it doesn't matter if you're talking about uh, the very early. Uh, ideas of optimization of labor during Fordism and Taylorism, which are part of the uh, more documentary style uh, movie that, that is in the show, or if you're talking about more contemporary uh, uh, ideas of uh, artificial intelligence or robotics, uh, that there is a very simple, uh, a very similar uh, sentiment uh, or in the reception of this, this kind of uh, anxiety of being replaced, this kind of not really understanding what is happening and maybe feeling overwhelmed by it. And I think it's, it's maybe a very simple way to say that, okay, there are this, uh, all these kinds of tools, but uh, at the end of the day, they are maybe not as clever as we think. And also there is, in, in no, no matter what we do with them, there is always this human component that actually defines the outcome. Actually, one of the characters of your film would say it at the moment, it don't work with artists and creation. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but, mm. yeah. but there is a, a, something else, it's about, um, let's say, the accumulation. Let's start to imagine about <coughs> accumulation of time. When you are um, in France, you accumulate time so you can take more holidays or go on strike. But the, uh, 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 um, this accumulation of time, if you think about history like what you were saying, it will provoke a kind of sedimentation. It's a sum. But actually, it's never like this because it's filtered all the time. Exactly like in geology. In geology, it's never accumulation only. It's actions. Human action, tectonic action, climate change, uh, actions. And this is also related to, to the fact that it's never one plus one plus one. It's something that we don't know how it is accumulating, what is the result, what's left. You, we are now having a, sharing the same discussion and each one of us will kept with maybe one sentence, another sentence. If we put all the sentence, we will never have the reconstitution of the, of the of the talk.
So this is what is interesting in this. Uh, it's not an addition of time, N neither in the labor things, because it's also, if you introduce, for example, the fact, like you were saying, I like this fact that uh, you change your eight hours of leisure. If you introduce mm, pleasure and the labor, how you have to consider it? It's still labor. labor. Mm -hmm. so you're asking the wrong people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you starting your work and when you you start starting your personal life? Where is the pencil to pay? But uh, uh, actually, we have to go always in the places where this category are scrambled, are, are blurry, because. Uh, my friends who are not artists, I have a few of them. I keep them I just as samples. That, uh, yeah, <laughs> but they are always, ah, uh, you take your picture or your water online and there's other people who would come and say, ah, you did this in five minutes and Matisse was saying, no, it took me 30 years. You see, so it's also a convention of, your, of time. Mm -hmm. This is, for me, it's um, rethinking about this. Notion are interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, you, we were today discussing certain questions about uh, this show, maybe... Yeah, I, I had yeah. some actually questions about the, uh, or not, I don't know, just uh, curious about the SCAM uh, project because it's such a fantastic, uh, rich and interesting project and I was also thinking about something that I also read um, on the website, I think, <laughs> about the project, and and uh, you also formulated in a uh, something like um, uh, uh, that a cartography of conflict, that it kind of maps a cartography of conflict, and that it's kind of then in a way relates to colonialism and the relationship between the north and the south. Yeah. And then I was also <coughs> like so. I mean, but I just wanted to ask you just because I'm curious in a way, like, because I really became really kind of interested in the, in the kind of socio-political or even geopolitical uh, about like, so who are these scammers? Like, are they organized? How do they kind of, how do they do this? I mean, they're, they're, it seems quite organized because it's so elaborate and follow these kind of patterns. And, but also, who are the, the people who, who are, scammed in a way and like uh, it's very and, uh, difficult yeah. to answer it, who are scammed because people uh, like Fidel will say it it's greedy people so he has no bad conscience about scamming greedy people mm -hmm. the greedy people answer it because it's always something that is yeah. about corruption so I'm, you are the trusty one, but what I'm going to ask you is not completely legal, but you will get a lot of money. And you will accept to do something that is completely legal because you want this money. So this is how Fidel answers it. The structure is usually very rarely just one person. It's a company. The last company that have been arrested is 220%. So you have to imagine that there's a specialist in, uh, in oil, another one in finance, another one in Switzerland, another one in, in Europe. So you have all the tasks inside the company so everyone can fulfill. And they are using, like exactly on a set, all the elements to make you plausible and so you will go into this nest. Exactly like in film, you will have to, uh, to create a the setup, the props, the costume. So he will talk about an Armani. <coughs> they buy a Rolex. They share the money to buy a Rolex and they wear it. Because if you see a Rolex, that <coughs> you are entering a process of believing. You see? It's all about elements. What you see, what you get, what you want. And it's about the desire of believing. But. Uh, this cartography is what led us at the beginning to start to think about this project. Because it really came from what kind of story I can tell coming from my, in my region. 
why I cannot make, for example, a story between two persons who love each other and make a comedy. Because suddenly I have to think about this person from her social background, her confessional background, her historical background, and little by little, it's not efficient anymore. It's becoming more and more complex. Because you have to, because we need this complexity. We have to go out of this binary world. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I never say that the people in Lebanon are not colonized in their spirit or in Africa, in some places in Africa. You are used to this, so you are showing how you see yourself. It's a, it's a question of representation for me. So, of course, you are um, dealing with these things and it's a cartography. It's a symptom of our history. But this is also why it's kind of disturbing for me with this trophy room, because I was almost thinking like, what is really the difference between this and like a kind of trophy of colonialism or imperialism in an ethnographical museum? You know, of like course, it's even over, uh, um, yeah, more it's often. Worse, uh, uh, right? And this is why we choose this display, actually. It is linked to... Mm. This display is, uh, is borrowed from uh, Lina Bobardi. When she, she, uh, Lina Bobardi is an architect, Italian, that moved in 1945 to, Ita uh, to, to Brazil. And um, she built the Sao Paulo Museum. And, when, and the opening museum uh, uh, exhibition of the Sao Paulo Museum was the um, museum without more, uh, walls from Manro. And this was a display. So it's about not showing the real event because these are not my images, but it's about creating, assembling, creating an atlas. So the question of the atlas and of the museum is exactly at the heart between Warburg and Malvo, this opposition, where you are producing meanings not just by accumulation, but by confrontations. Of course, the scam beaters are horrible people. As the scammers, as the victim, there is no victim. You see what I mean? A victim, you cannot think about a victim that is generic. You need a face for a victim. You need to see a person that has a history. And those people have no histories. They are just generic. This is why they call it trophy. You see? Mm, and it's very difficult to imagine because it's only when you will dare and go and take the scrolls to start to read the, 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 their story that little by little you will have some affection to to the person, and you will start to see it as a victim. But there still seems to be an, like an unequal power relation between the scammer and the scam beater, in a way. I mean, it's still a kind of replay of colonialism, like that the kind of, okay, you, you are in this poor country scamming me, but now I'm going to show you, like I'm going to do something even worse back. No. I don't know, like, or? No. Yeah, but no, 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 you, of course, but these are the trophies, mm. not all the rest. There's all the other stories. You see what I mean? These are the trophy of certain winners in a place, like you have the $202 billion that are the other trophy of others. You, you see what I mean? It's here you have to see who is writing the history. Mm. You see, uh, and so it, it changed completely the point of view. I'm not with the scam beaters. I'm saying that just the scam beaters allow us to go out of this dichotomy between scammers and victims. It shifts the gaze completely. The scammers can become a victim. In, in your words, this is what you are saying. Yeah. So there is no more category, and it's not anymore about belief and naive and things like that. So it's about desire of changing your life. So this is why these are stories that are incredible. Like, how can you believe that your sculpture that you produced in Lagos during the shipment shrinks half? It's a wood sculpture. So you cannot compete anymore. I will say there's only one artist uh, called Walid Raad who think about shrinking of artwork when they are going to Lebanon. But here, 
For who? For the scammer? Yeah. Most of the, the, the scam beaters know they have a life, <laughs> but we don't know if they have a life. You don't, you, you don't try to. What is their desire? It's just like revenge, or like. Yeah. Usually, it's white uh, uh, people who will vote for Trump. You yeah. see, <laughs> this is the kind of person they want to make justice. So it is. So, so you spoiled uh, 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 the money. Uh, you you took the money of such an American. We're gonna it Charles Bronson. <laughs> okay. uh, this is the people I, we met or we made them, we managed to make it because sometimes it's very violent like they ask that too, they ask things like this very un, uh, um, difficult and in the same time what is uh, fascinating for us is just the fact that these stories are for us unbelievable and the people we ask to embody those scans <coughs> have stories even more extraordinary than their stories. Like if you listen to, uh, to, to Sasha or Tamara, you will send the money. I assure you, because their stories are incredible. So it's, at the end, it's about this relation to your knowledge to a certain places and to what you accept. I think, I'm sorry, but I think we are slowly running out of time. Maybe we have last couple of minutes for some questions from the audience, if there are any. No? Okay, so Maybe then... Just a small comment. Uh, like when you were talking about like those people who are um, kind of born after uh, 1930s, I think Kaisa was talking about that. Uh, I would propose like a small term, like to, to maybe to call them like digital natives or like cloud natives, kind of people who are uh, somehow natives to those processes uh, that are happening kind of in this <laughs> digital, um, yeah. like with reality world. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a brief thing. Then um, yeah, maybe like yeah. Also thank you for for this interesting discussion about time, but. Um, yeah, maybe also like a comment um, on on some like overlapping of this um, time uh, that is uh, somehow allows us to travel um, like in in this kind of from one capsule to another kind of or um, uh, like to I don't know to sleep to sleep together or yeah uh, like. Um, on this, uh, um, like, uh, I'm interested in the processes where, when kind of time collapses and we somehow uh, don't know where are we, like, um, uh, like where are we now, <laughs> in a way, or is it even now or not? Um, yeah, so just briefly commenting on what you were talking about, like, on these um, structures of time and how they um, relates to each other and how they overlap, kind of. Do you have a comment? Um, like to elaborate on that, or mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, maybe I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, are you are you into like uh, this um, maybe um, politics of uh, xenofeminists that are somehow also working on? Um, these narratives that are overlapping or these accelerating processes because you, you were all like talking about this um, kind of accelerating processes that are happening now and how they kind of yeah, uh, correlate yeah yeah I mean the, 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 the idea of this um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the idea from the kind of queer feminist perspective uh, would be that the, the, these sort of linear times um, function through the kind of repression of other te times or temporalities. So, um, yeah, that's maybe not something that I kind of elaborated on. Um, um, yeah, no, I mean, um, I, I'm not very, like, uh, oriented in this kind of, uh, 
like I said, like I I, I read a little bit uh, around this uh, contemporary contemporaneity studies, which is very kind of fascinating field or um, uh, to think about what this like and the fact that we kind of define our now that that this time is called the now in a way uh, and how that relates to the past and to the future and how technology I mean I think it's really fascinating uh, and I don't have any like really uh, example to give at this moment but like uh, again this sort of uh, um, uh, thought-provoking idea of being able to uh, to think on different levels at the same time or be in different places and to to have a sort of co complexity of thought and uh, there is this uh, theoretician that I really like called Denise Ferrara da Silva yeah, um, and she also talks about this kind of uh, complexity of thinking of history and past and present, and uh, and it's very complicated, and it has to do with fractions and materialist uh, things. Uh, but it also ends up in some sort of like in some sort of poetry, um, which I think is um, a nice kind of ending point. But yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm maybe you were thinking something. No, I think it's fine. Do we, uh, do we have uh, some more comments or questions, maybe? I have just a very technical one from Kaiser. Uh, because when I was thinking about that browsing uh, sessions, you said you will be continuing this project, actually. And I was thinking uh, how much information actually is the actor who became somehow a director of his yeah. own grossing movie. He is the director. How much information is he given concerning like um, about you for example, about how it will be presented, in what context uh, the video will be presented and so on. Yeah. So how much is he actually affected because I think especially for this actor, but this is maybe a bit a strange case, he might be very much affected uh, by knowing uh, for what it is. So he might be really concerning on how the movie will be looking like in the end. So yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, uh, I don't, I mean, in this case, it was this uh, the format of this uh, this screening, and it was a screening at the opening. Um, otherwise, I mean, my idea has. Uh, I mean, uh, again, like. Uh, this is why the setting is so strange in a way, because then it is a sort of film, but it's not... Um, I don't think of it like that. And I don't know how to resolve that in the end. And that's actually the kind of future um, archive of this was actually not part of the instruction, like what would happen in the end. But my idea had always been that it would not be digitalized. Um, and so that it would be these films that you would have to kind of watch in, in, um, in a kind of uh, community or in a, in a setting like this uh, and that they would not be kind of, I mean, uh, not that they will be maybe hugely like uh, um, uh, spread and uh, uh, popular, but uh, um, yeah, so that was always my idea, to kind of keep them on these 16 millimeter wheels. And uh, I don't know, like I don't really, I really don't know. Like I was just, uh, the idea was just to collect these over these years where I will be in this institution. And then maybe I'll have to gather everybody again and kind of talk about it. I think well, I maybe, maybe I was, sorry, uh, maybe I was just, I said wrong before, I meant, how much information is the person that is browsing given? Oh, oh, you mean about what they're supposed to do? Yes. yes. Ah, okay. No, I mean about, uh, yeah, what will be the result basically? So how much is he aware about the art piece in general? The person that is browsing? You mean like, uh, like this uh, relation between the artist and the participant? Like yeah, I mean when he sits behind the computer and yeah. starts doing the stuff, how much is he or she aware of the of the result 
He prepared like uh, special pages for his Facebook, or he prepared, he made the research for the shoes before. No, I mean the instruction was that um, that it shouldn't be very thought through. That it should be just be kind of. Uh, but now you mean, but that was what I was trying to say, that I don't know, like it's not a, an art piece. And, uh, um, and I think I would have to come back to that after this kind of logins are, uh, um, are generated. So. I mean, just to answer it very simply, uh, the actor was uh, uh, given all the information you are actually hearing today, that uh, it's a kind of random browsing on the internet that it's gonna be a part of uh, Kaisa's archive, that it's gonna be part of a certain exhibition, and that's it since we don't know uh, what the second life of this uh, film will actually be. But <coughs> just a question. Uh, you see that uh, using the 16 millimeters, <coughs> For me, at least, um, maybe it's my glasses, but I was not able to read anything. No, no. Uh, meaning, all you have to shoot it at 35 if you consider that the content of the medium has can have an importance, mm -hmm. or it is after just about the interface. But it's blurry. It's, it's blurry. It's, it's blurry, and this is a technical. Uh, no, because uh, it's also the, of, no, no uh, it's the limit of the 16 millimeters. 16 millimeters is always a little bit. Yeah. Yes, but I was told that it should actually be very sharp, but uh, since the production uh, was quite uh, like pushed forward and uh, we didn't do a test screening before developing uh, the material. Because it so it's a camera at the shooting? Yeah. yeah. Um, Otherwise, uh, I presume that uh, with more attempts uh, and maybe the students at the film school were just not able to focus it properly. <laughs> um, sorry, this is the word of the new generation. <laughs> no, I'm sorry for such a last comment. I mean, uh, I think this is uh, this is a nice uh, end for the for the discussion, and maybe we can continue uh, personally. Uh, I think you should say another word. For I should say another word. The students were great. We love them, and we yes. thank them. So uh, maybe you can also use an opportunity to ask Khalil uh, something more after seeing the show and uh, we can all anyway discuss things further. So thanks a lot for spending the afternoon with us and enjoy the show. Thanks Khalil. <laughs> thanks, thanks.